nicely. Yeah. Okay, nice um, to see you. Yeah. So um, before John gets here, I was just asking Mike what he thinks um, of the, you know, the predicament that we're going through with COVID and how. Um, sorry, I have to take this. This is John. Hello, Jeff. How are you? This is uh, this is Mike Eldon. My 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 sitting mate. Remember, we were sitting once upon a time. <laughs> yes, you've been? been well. Um, keeping very well now, but I I had a really bad uh, COVID time for oh, a long time. Sorry. Uh, oh, I'm, sorry. I'm I'm back. I, yeah, I was in hospital for two weeks and. Oh, sorry, Mike. Sorry, Mike. But you're you're better now. I, yeah, I'm I'm back in the saddle very much, very much. Oh, thank you, thank you. Are you are you vaccinated now at all? Well, I'm I'm due to have my second shot later this month. Yeah. Okay. Okay. One thing oh. I can say is that unlike looking at you today, I don't think I've worn a suit all year, <laughs> and not nearly when I was in hospital for lots of weeks. <laughs> uh, let me let me officially give you a meeting. Then you at least can wear a suit now. <laughs> Nice to see you, though. Oh, God be blessed. Happy to see you well. Happy to see you well. Thanks. Thank and good to see you. OK, thank you. Irene, you're muted. Sorry. Um, so there we are. And uh, so. Um, oh, John, hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm also yes, somewhere. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm in between home and office, so I try I have to stop somewhere. Uh, oh. OK. <laughs> wow, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. There, there are quite a few people actually telling me that they're on the road um, and yeah. just trying to listen from wherever they are. I will also say thank you to those from the UK and from South Africa and from the US. Um, yeah, we are getting um, good viewership, so it's starting along very well. And so um, let me say that this, um, this session is officially started. Um, my name is Irene Gadiaka, um, and I am the host of this session tonight. And our guest is none other than John Gashura. And then we have a few um, panelists for a time that will ask a question each or give a comment as we go along. That's Mike Eldon, Geoffrey Odundo of NSC. And our sponsor tonight is Abojani Investments. Abojani Investments um, help with um, financial planning, financial investments, and they basically help you achieve your goal. So they are a, a financier to our sponsors tonight. Look out for them and engage them if you wanna make it to the next level financially. This session is officially open and um, we'll, some ground loops. This is um, this is a good session and it's a Q and A, but it's a, a session that looks to empower us. Um, John, John Gashara, if you remember the last time you were with us, you said that you believe that the business sector is largely the one that will lift Kenya from where we are to the next level, and so it's with that in mind that we invited you here today to continue on with the discussion um, we, because we are seeking to find our place in the ecosystem um, where we can carry on um, and find our place and carry on from where we are to the next level. And so without further ado, um, I had a question from Becky. I don't see her here. Um, Becky had asked, um, if you could please walk us through your journey as opposed to us going through your, your, your bio. Um, she's looking for a way that you can explain to us how to navigate careers, especially for young people, especially when it comes to pivoting. You started in engineering and you went on to banking from Wall Street to South Africa. And uh, most of us started like myself in banking, so we don't know nothing else. Um, so we are seeking to know um, how do we do that right and still achieve our goals of succeeding personally and also being um, leaving our mark in the space, in the business space. Let's start there. Thank you, Irene, and hi, everyone. Uh, glad, glad to be here. Um, interesting question you asked because I could uh, spend the rest two hours just talking about my journey. 
But, uh, but, but really quickly, um, as you say, I was one of those who studied engineering and now deeply into banking. Uh, my journey really um, started uh, in high school when I uh, uh, had to choose career. Uh, for, those of, for those of us who are a bit older, would remember our old system that by the time you're form four, then we used to go up to form six, you needed to have chosen the subjects that, uh, that basically pointed to what career you're going to have. Um, I went into engineering, uh, though uh, if, you ask, if you asked most of my family then, they thought I'd be a lawyer for some reason. And having studied engineering, I did up to master's level of engineering. And um, at that point I was deciding what to do next. And two things that came up. One was uh, I really um, had spent my, my master's, uh, or when I was doing my master's, this was at, uh, at MIT in electrical engineering. I, um, I really spent a lot of time in a basement lab doing a lot of experiments and in front of machines and all that good stuff. And so when I was deciding on my journey post-masters, I reflected on my strengths. And one thing became very clear. I enjoyed talking to people. I enjoyed spending time with people. And I could not see my future uh, being one where I spend all my time in the basement designing the, you know, the, the latest power systems or the latest um, uh, radios and, uh, and computers, which is what we were doing then. And, um, and in fact, I then decided that I had two options. One was to, if I'm going to stay in engineering, I would pursue a PhD and become a professor. So that was option one, in which case I'd be in front of people. That's, uh, that's what I imagined it would be to be a professor. Or if not, then I'll get a, a job uh, where I had to spend time with people. And really it narrowed down for me uh, that time in the States to either doing some banking or being a management consultant. Um, in essence, I got, um, so when I interviewed at that point, I got offers, one in management consulting, a couple of offers in banking on Wall Street. And that's really how I made my choice was uh, to go to Wall Street. The choice to go to Wall Street was, um, uh, was really driven by the fact that the job I had then was a lot of it was to do with computers on Wall Street. And given my, gap, my background, that made a lot of sense to me. The other thing I looked at was the trajectory of earnings, which I think it's important to mention. And I ended up taking my lowest paid job just because the trajectory of earnings told me that in a few years, I'd be earning a lot more. And that really was uh, how I ended up on, uh, on Wall Street. Uh, but since then, um, I have done a lot of things in banking. Um, I spent most of uh, my time in, uh, in America on Wall Street, um, grew up to, uh, well, uh, got to the level of what they call managing director. A managing director on Wall Street would be akin to a partnership in a law firm. In fact, before firms became publicly listed, used to be called partners. And I think you hear today, Goldman Sachs still have that, retain that title. Uh, so a managing director was equivalent to a partner. It took several years to get there. It was an, an election by the other managing directors by the time you go there. Um, and I must say that um, it was a great honor. And we got our, all our names published on the uh, New York Times as soon as you elected. So it was a great honor for, for, for me. But from there, I then transitioned to South Africa. I was recruited by Barclays, which back then owned APSA, uh, to come to South Africa and lead their investment banking, uh, covering what they call the rest of Africa, everything outside of South Africa. And that's how I ended up uh, in South Africa. Uh, did a number of roles, including being a regional CEO, where I looked at a number of banks uh, across the continent before then eventually joining, being recruited to come and head NIC, when the then CEO was appointed a cabinet secretary, uh, uh, that's uh, James Masharia. And uh, a few years later, we did a merger and here I am uh, leading NCBA. So that's been my journey. Um, I, I, I would say reflecting on the career because you asked me that question, is when I speak to uh, the young, uh, people now, I tell them that one of the hardest questions they will hear 
is what do you want to do? What do you want to be? Yeah, and often they get this pressure to, to say what they want to do in with their lives. What I, told, what I told them is that until you're about 30, 32, you really don't know what you want to do because you must try a number of things, go where your heart desires until you're about that time when you have to settle. Settling for a career in your 20s is difficult and you shouldn't, you shouldn't feel pressure to be able to say what you do. It's perfectly fine if you're 29 and you say, I don't know what I'm doing. It's perfectly okay. Now, if you're 40 and you're saying you don't know what you're doing, that's a problem. So I think, I think that's what I, that's the career advice I give uh, young people. Okay, so um, Rebecca, I'll call on you. Um, be ready, everyone that I call on, be ready with your questions so that we move quickly. Uh, Becky, um, if you could ask your question quickly. Uh, Becky, you're mute. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, John. Thanks, Irene. I think uh, your, how you've covered it, you've covered pretty much the question I had because I was asking as a youth, I'm still not 40 yet, and I've worked a lot with youths for the first five years of my career, and I'm still in the university environment, and it's a common anxiety that I've seen. I'm, I do mentorship, and that question keeps coming up, like people are so anxious about, am I making the right choice? Maybe someone wanted to do a career in arts, they, but they are realizing when they're on their third year of, of undergraduate, and it just adds on to the pressure, especially in Kenya, you know, where most people are in a hurry to finish, get a job, start supporting your family. So I think you've covered pretty much that, but I think putting Kenya's context into consideration, what would you advise that Kenyan youth who's currently choosing a course, who doesn't have uh, what I would call so much luxury, they need to be in a stable job as quickly as possible because of the realities in our economy. Uh, good, good question. I, I think the, the current generation has great advantages and great disadvantages over, over our generation. And I hope um, Mike and uh, Jeff is a bit younger, he will agree. Um, and and the reason I say that is that today, the advantages they have is access to information. They have a lot of access to information. They can read about any career. They can connect with anybody in the world. So that connectivity is advantage that we did not have uh, when we were making these choices. The disadvantage they have though, is that the future of jobs is unknown. Uh, a lot of new jobs you sprout out of nowhere they're being created daily, uh, whether that be Silicon Valley, our own Savannah Valley, many other places. And for that reason, the best advice I can give somebody who is young, trying to figure out their career, is actually the most important element for success, which is passion. What are you passionate about? What do you enjoy? So the person you talked about who does art, um, you know, if they enjoy art, the career in art is great. I mean, today, animated movies and animated uh, videos that we watch every day, the artists making tons of money just doing that. Um, you know, uh, and, and there's a lot of other things to do given the tools available uh, to, uh, to, uh, to develop yourself. So I, I think that's the one advice I give. The second advice I give people is what I call self-improvement. And self-improvement never ceases. Even for me, I try every day to self-improve, whether you're reading books, going to conferences. I tell people a story. When I joined Wall Street and I was doing quite okay, um, I realized that uh, as I got senior and I would go to meetings where I was a senior most person from the bank and I would be with these Americans, uh, I realized that every time a question would come up in a meeting, I would answer it. There was always that other question directed at Mike or Greg, and there would be almost a similar question. It occurred to me that actually the issue was two things. One, people did not understand my accent. The second problem was I was going by the name Gashora and most people could not pronounce it. So they'd rather call Greg because that's the name they remember. So I immediately went back to being called John. And more importantly, I enrolled at New York University 
for an accent reduction class. And through that, I was able to actually get to a point where uh, if somebody did not understand me it was because they did not want to understand. It was no longer because of my accent. So self-improvement is something you must do uh, intensely and keep doing it at all times. Um, thank you. That is, that's a new snippet. We didn't know that about you, that uh, you had to go to an accent reduction class. And so the way we're going to do this is I'm going to read one of the questions that have come through already, and then I'll call on one of the panelists. So we'll interchange like that. And so, John, let's start with a bit of a serious matter now. Um, we are in the midst of a pandemic. Um, some people feel lost while others like yourselves might actually be looking at this as uh, an opportunity, a way uh, of an opportunity to do things a little differently, to improve. Um, but overall, uh, there is anxiety. Um, where do you see this going and how do we navigate in a way that we don't kill our morale and our businesses in the process? Look, um, it's difficult times for everyone, Irene. Um, I uh, sympathize with anybody who has uh, either family or friends who have been affected by this, um, uh, by this disease. And, and I think it will continue to be problematic for quite some time. Uh, a lot of people who have not, you know, uh, health-wise been affected have obviously got their businesses affected as well and their livelihoods. So I do, um, uh, I, I do sympathize uh, with uh, with, 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 with us and with myself in, included. Um, you talked about the opportunity and the difficulties. I think the difficulties are known. We have talked a lot about the difficulties, the many SMEs that are about to close down. Uh, I was talking today with someone and telling them that one of my biggest pain is to read the, man, the Monday newspaper and see how many auctions or auction pages there are. And, and when I know probably two of those pages are mine, I mean, it's a painful, painful thing to read on Mondays. And, and, and then think about, you know, um, Kenyans, we are very good at owning hotels, what we call hotels, sometimes they're not hotels, but you find almost every family owns something akin to an inter entertainment join, a hotel, a duka or something. And all those are going through tough times. I think to the question of, uh, so the question of difficulties, I think I don't want to, uh, to be there, but I think we all know. But you asked about opportunities. I think there are, you know, Warren Buffy said that, you know, when, when everybody is afraid, there's a time to be bold. Yeah, and I think we're in a time when everybody is afraid. The future is unknown. I talked about the auction pages. Much as I reflect about the pain of those people whose items are being auctioned, whose houses are being auctioned, I also reflect on the opportunity of somebody who has money to put to work. I think there's a great opportunity and I encourage anybody who has money to also read that newspaper with glee um, on Mondays because the opportunities there are great to get some assets uh, on the cheap. Um, I say that also recognizing that maybe you're not able to get your hands on it, but look at the stock market, for example, today. Uh, we are all trading sub one times our, our book. Uh, a bank like ours is trading at, I believe, 0.6 uh, to the book. Uh, we are a strong institution, really well governed, and I hope with good management, uh, I think the future can only be bright. And those are opportunities that I see in the future uh, for anybody who has uh, money to put to work. More importantly, is that for those in business, this is the time to reflect, to reassess, and think about the gaps, the many gaps that exist. I was talking to somebody recently who told me that they have changed their business model from they were doing hotels and malls, and now they have gone into affordable housing. Uh, and I asked them, uh, what do you mean affordable housing? They told me they're developing in areas like Zimmerman, Kalangware, you know, uh, or Kalau and other places. And what they were telling me is, look, right now, most people are holding on to cash. And we see it, bank deposits are up. And in a few years, you have all these people, the economy fully reopens, they need somewhere to live. Most people will not want to share those bed sitters and those singles 
And these are opportunities that he sees in the future. And so I think looking into those little gaps that exist, um, I see them as uh, great opportunities. Um, uh, along that line, how is financing then for those opportunities from banks like yourselves and the others? Look, um, if you look at our book, and uh, this is true, I guess, for most banks today, we are overly invested in government paper. Yeah. And we ourselves, we are about 35 to 40% invested in government paper. That's not a comfortable position to be. We would love to find people who uh, would take loans from us, um, obviously in a, in a credit worthy manner, um, because we'd rather uh, use our money to build the economy than to pack in government paper. So I think that is an echo you hear across the banks that they are ready to support uh, the recovery of the economy. All right, and so we'll go to Mike, um, because your question kind of follows closely to um, what John has just said. So um, ask your question. Hello, John. Um, recently, uh, the banks have been announcing their results. It gave nice juicy headlines in the newspapers about how much growth there has been in profits. It's even knocked Ruton Ryla off the front page sometimes. <laughs> and so obviously the perception now, as it often is, is that the banks are making too much money and they're being too harsh with non-performing loans, interest rates, whatever. And I'm wondering how you handle that perception and how you uh, portray yourselves as being responsible citizens treating all stakeholders fairly. Thank you, Mike, and good to see you, Mike. I read a lot from you on the caps of all. Uh, so uh, great, and, and, and of course, your, your weekly um, article in the newspaper. So is it one? Fortnightly, sorry, I, I read it so much, I thought it was weekly. Uh, so great, <laughs> great to see you, great to see you. Um, good question. I, I think that's a real struggle for banks. I, I want to start by saying all over the world, banks are hit. I think you all remember the 2008 crisis, global crisis. And, you know, um, it created the um, Occupy Wall Street movement where people really wanted to demonstrate how much they hate banks. They're willing to, to, block, the, to block people from going to work. Um, I'm not saying it's a good thing. It's a terrible thing. And to your point, reporting these wonderful profits or pro, I should say profit growth, not profits, because yes, yes. What, what people are sensitive to is perhaps the growth in this economy is perhaps the wrong thing. And I've had this conversation with, um, with also uh, my friend, the, the governor on this matter, uh, especially in my capacity as a KBA, Kenya Bankers Association chairman. Look, I think uh, one, I would say that last year when COVID hit, um, banks were the first to move with uh, addressing what we thought were concerns of our customers. I think you all agree that uh, as soon as COVID hit, banks were the first to come out and say a number of things. One, that we will restructure loans that were in difficulties. Number two, we say that we offer moratoriums uh, on anybody who cannot pay their loans uh, for a period of time. We came out and agreed that we will in fact uh, without announcing it, we agreed to suspend new auctions. So whatever the auction pages became fewer and fewer uh, last year. And the last thing I would add is that we all agreed that, um, you know, transfer of money from uh, bank to, uh, to mobile wallet would be free. Why did we do that? Because we figured that not only will people want to use their mobile wallets um, in terms of addressing COVID, but we also thought those who had money in banks would be the ones called upon by their families and their relatives to send them support. And we wanted to make that easy for them to do. So all those were things that we did very quickly. And I should say, actually, lastly, is we agreed not to register anybody on CRB for quite a period of time who had borrowed, I believe, uh, less than, I can't remember the amount. Um, so we had set an amount. And, and we did that. Uh, and, and I think um, when we did the survey in around May, April, May of last year, 
uh, all the feedback we got were banks were absolutely in favor and everybody loved banks. A year later, here we are, um, having taken huge provisions last year as we accommodated our customers, we are now recovering some of those provisions. We are now taking lower provisions and therefore the growth in profitability. So that's really where it's coming from. It's not so much that we have raised interest rates. We have not uh, instituted back those charges that we dropped, the mobile, uh, the bank to wallet charges, for example. Uh, it's not that we are not uh, restructuring. We still are, we are supporting customers. So we are doing all those things we agreed we'll do. I think the, uh, the reality is that what has happened is really um, on provisions. That's probably the biggest number. I also want to explain a bit on provisions, if you allow me, that yeah. provisions, provisions is a leading indicator of the future. It's not the present. So we take provisions yeah, when we see a problem coming. And so we predict there'll be a problem, we take provisions to this. So last year we took a lot of provisions because we knew that there'll be problems and we have seen them come. And so what you see is what we call non-performing ratios are actually going up now because this is when you're recognizing the problem we saw last year. This year we are seeing that the economy is starting to open uh, businesses are starting to, uh, to reopen, SMEs, uh, much as they are, they are suffering, they are, most people are back to work, and therefore we see the problem uh, won't be as severe as we foresaw last year. That's why the provisions have gone down. Now, let me also, since, you are, since Mike, you asked, let me also say this, that um, during the interest rate cap discussions, this question came up a lot about banks making too much money. So now not mm. the growth, but the, but the absolute, yeah? That question came up a lot. And what I asked was really simple. Look at a bank like my bank, NCBA. If you look at my equity, equity is what shareholders have put in, yeah? They have put in 72 billion shillings into this bank. That's the money I have from shareholders. And I always ask, if you had a billion shillings to invest, what return would you expect? Yeah? And I think universally for Kenyan, at that point when we did that survey, we expected 20 to 30% because land was appreciating at those rates. Yeah? Wow. My return on equity this year so far has been 12.5%. And I know uh, that there are some investors would be interested on that, on that comment has been 12.5%. Now, my shareholders, if you ask them, they will say, I can get that in government paper without paying taxes. And so it's in the, it looks like a lot of money the bank is making. But if you look at it from a, an investor perspective, it's actually not that much. Yeah, so I, I thought I would give that reference point as well. Sorry, sorry to, to take so much time, Mike. Yeah, yeah, that's can, I, can I just make a couple of quick comments sure. about sure. John's earlier comments? Firstly, on your accent. When I went for my ISEC internship in Iowa in 1967, there were people in Iowa who told me they couldn't understand me because of my <laughs> English accent. But unlike you, I, I didn't go for uh, any coaching. <laughs> and the other one is I liked your comments about what do you enjoy and what's your passion? because um, when I came here and because of what ISEC had done for me, I joined the board of advisors of, of ISEC Kenya, which was just starting mm -hmm. in um, the late seventies. And yes. we started running these careers guidance um, workshops, um, me with ISEC organizing them. And the one thing that I particularly focused on and spent nearly all the time on was that first stage that's usually totally absent, self-exploration, because that's what tells you what you enjoy and what you may be passionate about. Yes, and we yes. were doing this in the late 70s um, with undergraduates at the University of Nairobi, so that as they looked at their achievements and the strengths that explained them, where should that lead them? Very and good. I've been doing that sort of work ever since. Um, Excellent. Excellent. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, and so we're just trying to cover as many questions as we can. So that's why the, the rush, John, um, bear with us. Someone is asking whether you were pushed or you jumped in regard to uh, instituting the moratorium and um, putting a cap on listing people at the CRB, um, but you'll come to that. Then the next question is, um, you are now the head of uh, the chair of the Kenya Bankers Association. So how do you see the banking sector unfolding? Um, give a five-year high-level overview and not just in Kenya, but the region. Thanks. Uh, so, so, so let me, I, I, I can let the other comment go ahead. <laughs> to, um, yeah. to say that actually we had uh, very productive meetings with the central bank before they made those announcements. So it was actually agreement. Uh, in fact, the, the detail of which I cannot share, but we actually gave, uh, we actually came across understanding even more than people might imagine. Uh, we, we asked for more leniency to customers and even Central Bank was considering at that point. So <laughs> I just wanna say that we, 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 uh, we, we were not necessarily pushed. It was very collaborative between ourselves and, uh, and the regulator. I think on your second question, what do we see for the banking sector? Obviously, it's a very tough time for anyone to have a crystal ball, a crystal ball yeah, given that we're in the, still in the middle of this pandemic. So it's, it's difficult. But I think if I just look at the little history we have uh, of the banking sector, um, is that, first of all, banking is becoming, banking products have become a commodity. So today, um, you can go to any bank and you probably get the same product. Uh, pricing again has become well publicized. Everybody knows the rates that NCBA is going to charge or pay for deposits compared to another bank. So uh, banking as a service is also becoming a commodity. I think what you'll find is that um, there'll be more sensitivity as to the uh, what I call the stability um, and safety of banks. And I think we saw that after the Chase and Imperial Bank uh, happenings uh, here in Kenya, people become more sensitive about the quality of the bank institution um, and the safety of their money. Um, so, so that's one thing we'll see. And in this region, unfortunately, that safety is always interpreted from size. So again, what you see then, the response from banks is you see banks trying to scale up a bit faster, whether that be regional expansion or even here at home. Ourselves included, uh, we are a result of a merger. Why did we merge? Was because we felt that scale was important and we felt that uh, it uh, gives people a bit more safety. And given where we are today, we realize now that we have scale uh, we have the capital to expand, hence the expansion um, process we are going through where we are opening a few branches almost every month. Um, I think the other thing you'll find is obviously that um, as banks get bigger in this region, regulators also get smarter. So the demands on regulators are growing every day. Uh, and so banks in the response to regulators you see them beefing up uh, technology. You see them beefing up, beefing up their risk management areas. That's what I expect to see uh, going forward. Do I expect cross-border uh, mergers? Yes, uh, I think um, we do have too many banks, uh, whether that be Kenya, I'll say the same for Tanzania, Uganda, um, in all these areas, we have too many banks. And whereas before we used to say is the niche and the choices, I started by saying banking, products and services have become a commodity. So the niche and choices are probably not as much anymore. What we will see is bigger banks that then can compete on price. And in developed markets, that's what you'll see is big banks compete on price. They give all, all products like a commodity, but then the price comes down for everybody. Um, I think that is what, uh, that's what you'll see. So I, I hope I have sort of covered in broad terms, what I think it will look like. 
Um, we'll, we'll break it down as we go, uh, given the questions that are coming through. For instance, um, Dr. B, Beatrice is asking, um, thank you for taking time to speak with us. Um, her background is healthcare and she, it's, she says it's perplexing that it would appear that banks continue to consider risk in a seemingly blanket approach. Um, is there any intention to customize risk so as to tailor banking services to different professions, e.g. healthcare? I would answer that strongly by saying yes. Um, I think it's, um, <clears throat> you know, obviously everybody has the experience, but for, for large banks like ourselves, we spend a lot of time looking at different sectors and therefore understanding the risk in different sectors. What would happen then is the structure of the offering in different sectors will be different. So for example, in healthcare, if I may talk about NCBA, one of the things we are very strong in is asset financing. So we will finance uh, medical equipment. We do that quite a lot. Equip hospitals, we do that quite a lot. Um, and so we do support quite a bit of, uh, of uh, healthcare in that respect, because that's what we are good at. I think if you look at equity, equity has uh, Equi Health, uh, which I understand the finance doctors uh, to set up uh, centers, medical centers, uh, more important to offer those services. And I think if I went to every bank, I'll find how they look at health care as a sector. And I would say that's how we segment all our sectors is then we come up with particular solutions for those sectors. Would you say that is um, that can be found in the rest of the banks because you seem to have something a little extraordinary um, that may not necessarily be with the other banks? Well, it wouldn't be found in every bank, um, yeah. I think, but uh, for the large banks, I think you'll find those products. Okay. Um, yeah. And so, um, Jeff, um, if 